So if there are no questions on that, I will uh, go ahead and start. And uh, as part of this focus week, I thought I'd give a brief introduction uh, and overview and raise some questions uh, regarding the topics of this week. And so I'll just first start out with the uh, obvious statement that there's widespread belief uh, of the equivalence between string theory in anti de Sitter space and conformal field theory uh, on the boundary. Uh, and if indeed uh, there is a true equivalence, then that's very helpful because it gives a definition of quantum gravity in anti de Sitter space, at least, uh, which uh, you know, should give us a very important guide to formulating quantum gravity more generally. Uh, but, of course, there's a big question. How do we make this equivalence precise, uh, if it's true? And, in particular, how do we use the uh, conjectured equivalence to answer the various very difficult bulk questions that we've encountered? For example, the question of how is gravitational scattering unitarized, the whole question of the uh, black hole information problem, uh, et cetera. And of course, you know, most recently we've seen uh, in the discussion of the singular horizon or firewall story, this set of questions come to the fore again. How do we think about reconstructing, say, through some ADS-CFT, uh, something like the interior of a black hole, or is that impossible? So first, what is a precise statement of the ADS-CFT correspondence? And if it is a true equivalence, the obvious possibility uh, is the following. Uh, so we expect that quantum gravity in the bulk should have a Hilbert space, if it's an actual quantum theory. Uh, and of course, the boundary theory has a Hilbert space. And there should be a map between them that's one-to-one -one onto and uh, preserves inner products, basically is unitary or isometric. And if there is such a map that we can find, uh, then that tells us how to map uh, back and forth between bulk operators that act on the bulk Hilbert space and boundary operators. And likewise, we can understand bulk evolution uh, also via this map from the boundary unitary evolution uh, in the CFT. And of course, that's supposed to be the explanation for why we have a unitary uh, bulk theory of quantum gravity. So clearly, the critical question, though, is what is this map M? How do we relate the two Hilbert spaces in a precise way, uh, matching onto the various things that we know, and also meeting certain expectations for what the bulk theory should look like? Hey, Steve? Yeah. Does every operator have to be matched, mapped or only the observables? Uh, well, you have in mind non-gauge invariant things, or what are you asking? I'm fishing. You're fishing. <laughs> <laughs> the things that Don constructed, for example, we don't know how to translate them into the boundary. Things which, which ones? His, his relational objects. Uh, yeah, no, well, right. No, we don't know. We'll get to that. We don't yet know, right? But if we have a map, one-to-one -one on two map between the two Hilbert spaces, and if there's an operator over yeah, here that acts on the Hilbert space, then you know, we can go back and forth. That's what a map will do yeah. in absolute generality. So every, every operator. <coughs> there's there's every, a small yeah. mathematical fact that is kind of makes this look a lot simpler than it really is. Every every Hilbert space that has a countable basis has such a one-to-one -one onto isometric mapped into every other one. Right. So the, the simple harmonic yeah, oscillator is equivalent. Infinite dimensional. I said every count yeah, countable yeah, basis, infinite, infinite dimensional. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Um, and and yeah. uh, so if there's such a map, there's a map between the harmonic mm -hmm. oscillator and the standard model Hilbert space. Yeah. Hilbert space of string theory on any space you want. 
so it's really important that you specify what this map is doing to very particular operators. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're not saying anything. It has to respect the dictionary. Absolutely. It, it has to respect some yeah, So dictionary. matching what we know, that's part of that. And yeah, also, obviously, we don't want to map to useless things in the book. We want to map to useful things in the book. We want to match on to things that, uh, that you know, meet our expectations for the kinds of physical objects that we would like to describe in the book. So, but that's a, I agree, that's a very good point. Just following up on that question, why is it a useful statement of the correspondence given that it's much more general? Um, well, no, the useful statement is, you know, well, assuming there is an M, and that's part of the question. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the real interesting question is, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, how do we understand it? And that's something we've been grappling with in various ways. I thought you first have to answer what the B is. Of course. Is it <laughs> uh, well, some people would like to assert that uh, we know what this is, and so all we then have to do is find M, and then we construct that. Okay, so, and, you know, that's, that's one way of reading the AS, ADS-CFT correspondence, that it's a constructive uh, way of uh, so saying what did quantum gravity is. Actually, what we know is, <coughs> although HP isn't defined, and there are lots of infinite number of maps one could construct, yeah. there's one that has a semi-classical... For example, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ball. yeah, I think that that's one of the uh, sort of goals, or, or at least... Yeah, goals of ADS-CFT from certain people's perspective is, you know, start from the boundary theory and define quantum gravity this way. And, of course, you've got to have a way to, you know, see how to map onto bulk operators that are sort of well, useful for both things. There's a great map called M equals the identity uh, Yes, but again, it doesn't satisfy this criterion of, you know, relating to things with familiar properties in the bulk. So again, say approximately semi-classical space-time, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, the usual S matrix for scale small as compared to the ADS radius. And so, so. so I'll elaborate more on that. In fact, uh, <coughs> so we'd like to find M. Uh, what bulk quantities do we expect to be able to uh, relate through M or to construct via M? And Two leading candidates uh, are, well, first of all, the S matrix. And the place where we really could match onto our usual intuition about that is in the flat limit or the limit where the ADS radius is large. Uh, and another uh, possible target is a set of some appropriate, approximately at least, local observables. Uh, for example, along the lines discussed on Friday, or, or maybe we're after something else. That's part of the question, really. Uh, of course, uh, in local quantum field theory, if we have one, we have the other, and so we should also bear that in mind. Uh, and what I'll do, uh, again, to sort of catalyze discussion is discuss some aspects of uh, these two possible targets uh, in turn. So first, the S matrix. Uh, and what is a starting point for describing the S matrix? Well, we'd like to have some notion of scattering states. So if we think about ADS in the large radius limit, say 10 to the 10 light years, outside the, uh, what, basically what we can see in the present day universe, uh, then we expect uh, if we're you know, setting or describing a quantum gravity theory in the bulk that we should be able to uh, in particular, describe states that, uh, say, correspond to two wave packets that are much smaller than the ADS radius and are colliding in a much smaller region than the ADS radius. So there should be some state uh, in the bulk theory uh, that describes such a scattering state. Uh, and again, this is sort of a picture at a given time, and then we would evolve that in time to study scattering. Uh, now, of course, really we want... Uh, complete set of such states, uh, various multi-particle states, to match on to the familiar S matrix. And of course, we want you know, similar states sort of asymptotically in the future, or at least a long time in the future. And then we expect to get out the S matrix by taking you know, overlaps of 
such states. So that's the kind of structure we would uh, like to be able to find uh, and reproduce, basically, or produce from the boundary theory. <clears throat> so there are really two. You're not worried here about infrared issues. Uh, there is some concern about infrared issues, yeah. Uh, you know, of course, if we're in a higher dimensional bulk, those get better, but there are still uh, issues of dressing, uh, like we discussed. Uh, you know, how, how should I really think about creating a particle plus its gravitational field? So, you know, we have to be, I agree we have to be careful about that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, we do have, at least in the familiar apparatus of local quantum field theory, uh, a good approximate description, of course, of, say, scattering in QED. And so we should be able to match on to that kind of description. Okay, so a first question is, uh, as part of this, is can we construct scattering states uh, from the boundary data, uh, <coughs> namely construct these uh, in the boundary Hilbert space? And then if you can, uh, and then you look at basically the boundary evolution, do you get uh, from this, uh, well, sort of overlap between states, do you get something that behaves like the S matrix of local quantum field theory, basically when it should, say for low energy scattering, et cetera. Uh, and of course, ultimately, if you have the full construction, we'd like to say, uh, find out what it tells us more generally. Uh, for example, in the context where local quantum field theory is breaking down in the bulk and we're doing something like forming black holes or uh, looking at other strong gravitational phenomena. So that's a target. Uh, in the 10D S matrix. Uh, ultimately, yeah, yeah, if we're really resolving scales small as compared to the ADS radius, although for many purposes we forget about the S5 because we understand how things get localized on the S5 via the usual kaluza klein story. So. Okay, so that's what we're after, some construction of uh, scattering states in, the, uh, in ADS. Uh, first, let's remind ourselves how this works in flat space and the usual procedure is via LSZ, which is, you know, as we remember from our field theory classes, you know, it's non-trivial at first, but then basically we take it for granted. Uh, but there is, you know, something non-trivial to show. Uh, and remember the construction is you take, uh, you know, field operators that you smear at some uh, time that's far in the past, and you can produce uh, wave packets that basically become single particle incoming wave packets. Uh, and uh, as part of achieving that, you take the limit as this initial time goes to minus infinity. And among other things, that uh, turns off the mutual interactions between these two wave packets. And so you can cleanly produce you know, two incoming single particle wave packets. Again, modulo some of the IR issues, say, in QED, et cetera. Uh, so is there an analog of this in the context of ADS, and what is it? Uh, so you might say, well, let's think about normalizable states, and we'd like to similarly set up uh, such a construction. Here's the boundary of ADS. I'm being a little schematic. Uh, but, of course, if we deal with, say, normalizable states, there's a problem of isolating the interaction we want, because normalizable states do this for all time. And so there's a, a question of how do we uh, isolate a single scattering, you know, without having access to the bulk field operators. Uh, if specifically we're working purely in the boundary theory. Uh, and so at least this raises the uh, question of whether the boundary theory leads to some kind of averaged amplitudes where you average over the multiple interactions and you're not isolating a single scattering. So a question about how to... Uh, extract what you want. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's sort of a classical related problem, and that is uh, if you think about classical scattering in ADS, classical gravitational scattering, you know that there are actually problems with the perturbation expansion in G because ultimately uh, you have a non-perturbative breakdown through formation of uh, basically black holes in the book. So there's, I think, a, uh, a real question here, but... Uh, Anyway, let me raise that. Uh, 
what's an alternative? Well, you could just as well try to uh, take the states out to the boundary, so work with non-normalizable states. And those are produced by smearing a boundary operator with an appropriate smearing function to create an incoming wave packet. So that's an alternative to try to cleanly get away from the multiple interaction problem. But here there's a potential problem as well. Uh, ADS behaves like a box with basically an infinite potential barrier going out to infinity. And so if you want to produce a finite wave packet here, you need infinite amplitude at infinity. That's the statement that we're dealing with these non-normalizable states. Uh, and that means that if you're producing a nice finite amplitude here, well, you've also got sort of the infinite amplitude back here. And, and how do we know, unless you know, these two are completely non-overlapping, that you don't have interactions sort of out near the boundary? And so generically, uh, in fact, uh, those kinds of interactions can sort of contaminate the scattering process that you're trying to isolate. Uh, and in fact, they can be either, depending on the dimensions of the uh, states we're considering, either uh, infinite, they can make infinite contributions or, or finite contributions that still confound your attempts to isolate an interaction in the middle. Uh, <clears throat> the problem being, again, well, if you take the Fs to be non-compact, uh, then you know, basically these tails, which are naively small, uh, you know, in the end, they get to be very large as you go out to the boundary, and so you can have big overlaps, big interactions. Jim? If you take it to be compact, then. That's next. If we're Jim. describing scattering in the bulk, why do we have to take the times all the way to infinity? Uh, How about just a, like a year? Well, yeah, we want some kind of limit where we can work with, uh, you know, Long times as compared to, say, the scale of our scattering process. Yes, but why does that limit have to be you know, long compared to uh, uh, the time you try to control the position of the estimate? What? That's the definition. Yeah, yeah but that's uh, yeah. talking about a real experiment. It doesn't last for me. Yeah, at LHC, you don't need to know what the wave packets were doing even a day ago, right? That's my point, <laughs> so, right? Okay. Yeah. Good. No, but the problem is, is you need to know that, the, let's remind ourselves of the rules. We're trying to understand how the bulk theory is constructed from the boundary theory. And so the, the question is, uh, you know, if we can't reach in here and act with field operators by hand, because we don't have the bulk theory, uh, how in the boundary theory do we describe the kinds of states we want? And if we're working in the boundary theory, we've got a limited number of handles on the subject, and that I'm describing some of the handles. Does somebody wanted the U matrix, you couldn't do it in this? The U, remind me what the U matrix? Finite time. Fi oh, finite, yeah, just, okay. Well, no, the, yeah, so the question is how to, you know, if we go back early in the talk, uh, if we, yeah, go back to a finite time, uh, how could we identify, in terms of the boundary Hilbert space, the states that correspond to an incoming electron over here and an incoming electron over here and some wave packets that are, say, separated by a mile. Oh, I see. That's a problem also. Yeah, the question is how do we do that in the full interacting boundary theory? That, because you know, we'd like to construct things from the boundary. So how do we find those states? How do we describe them in the boundary theory? Can you just talk about getting the correlation from? We'll get there, I hope. Uh, uh, We've got to figure out what. No, this should be a discussion as long as we don't go past T. So. You're envisioning this living on global ADS? On, on yeah, I'm drawing ADS. pictures in global ADS. I, so that's the, the simplest thing. Really have a, I mean, still has finite volume. Uh, the field theory lives on the sphere, yes. Yeah. Do you see this as a problem if you're interested only in constructing the S matrix? Where all states going in and all states going out are tachyons that live near enough to bright loader Friedman bound that both modes are normalizable? Uh, as I said, these the interactions can either be uh, well. You, you want to go back to the yeah to the non-compact case, and the question is uh, yes, depending on the dimensions, you either have um, infinity or finite here uh, for these contributions. But even if you have finite contributions that are competitive with the actual interaction you're after, uh, then you've got the challenge of disentangling those from the interaction you're after. So there's something to check. 
And like, in fact, in gravity, if these are gravitons, you also uh, can get rid of the infinities, basically because the energy redshifts at the boundary, et cetera. So, so effectively, the contributions are finite, but there's still a question of whether you know, they are competing with the amplitude you're after. So, so sorry, and you're, 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 you're asking you're trying to, in the end, construct the flat space as my um, It's because you're trying to create uh, states in the middle, again, by sending them in, sending in the wave packets from the boundary, and you know, really the uh, wave packets kind of blow up at the boundary, yeah. basically. But so. unless you were, you know, I mean, I, you're also trying to interested in constructing the flat space. Yeah, or, or whatever you're going to do, the limit of maybe yeah. is really going to be to Well, or just fix it to be 10 to the 10 light years. Because otherwise, whatever yeah. it is, exactly. yeah, it is yeah. the analog of this. Good, yeah. It's the only yeah, yeah, no. you have anyway. No, yeah, I want something that, again, uh, we can compare with things we know, like local quantum field theory, the description of scattering, you know, good at particle accelerators, and so on and so forth. So I want to match on to... Local quantum field theory and ADS. Yes, well, sorry, what's wrong or with the S matrix we measure at the LHC <laughs> at CMS. <laughs> for that. What's that? <laughs> what we measure at LHC. Maybe not exactly the S matrix, but okay. Gary. Um, well, why can't we work with these normalizable wave packets that you had a moment ago? And avoid this averaging by simply looking at the, you know, boundary uh, amplitude or the boundary result after one sort of ADS crossing time. Yeah. And well, go to infinity on the boundary. So I think what you're asking is, um, is there some way we can relate, say, the bulk Heisenberg picture operator, which creates a wave packet over here, to the boundary? Uh, say, operator. No, they, no, they, no, there's just a state. There's a normalizable state in the bulb, normalizable. which is going to be described by some normalizable state in the boundary, which will represent your two particles yeah. you know, coming in. Yeah. The and question is, what's the map between them in the interacting theory? How do you map from, yes. how do you describe? So for the, the practical question of how you construct the state on the boundary corresponding to the state. Well, so it, the problem it, is not that you're averaging yeah. over lots of interactions. You just want to know it at one time. Well, when you try to set up the, you know, say, perturb perturbatively, how do we construct the map, say, uh, beginning with what we know about the free theory, you do encounter the problem of multiple interactions. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to Again, drive it. It's coming back to Tom's earlier question. You know, we don't want to just say there's an M, right? We need to know what the M is for it to be at all useful. Yeah. So, sorry, you don't. I, I had the same question as Gary. So I thought you could just yeah. work with a state at a given time which had very localized wave packets. You mean and, and it, this and is in the so bulk like, description or yeah, in the boundary yeah. description? No, in the, in the bulk. But then, okay. then it's true they will bounce back and do all sorts of things in the past. Yeah. But you don't care. Just let them do whatever they're going to do in the past. Um, but but the question is how do I what's the if I want a bulk state with incoming wave packet here incoming wave packet here mm -hmm. I want that bulk state what's the description of it in the boundary that, that is a separate question from the problem of multiple interactions it's not as separate as you think uh, it seems to be at the linearized level we know how to do it right it, you mean if you turn off the coupling Zero coupling. Yeah. Then it's completely true. trivial in the zero coupling limit. But Steve, do you, do you think that this is an issue in perturbation theory already? The way you're stating it sounds like it's a very general geometric issue, whereas in perturbation theory, where I get these Witten diagrams, it seems manifest from the work of some people who are here that you get this, the flat space answer by taking the limit. Which, the sorry, you get, story I'll, I'll come back to Mellon, ultimately. Okay. But, I, you know, if someone, friends, if someone, not, if someone wants either. to tell me what this map is, great, we'll all go home. But I don't think anyone has that so in their pocket. Make, make clear what the, what the two sides of the map are. Okay, so first what I'd like is, uh, say, two wave packets, you know, electrons or whatever, coming in here that are localized as compared to the ADS radio. <laughs> That's the state I'm after. So, so sorry, in the full interacting theory. And the question is, uh, how do I describe that uh, as a state in the boundary theory? That's what I'd like to construct. That's constructing a scattering state using the boundary data, a bulk scattering state. 
using And that. do you want to do that in a way that enables you to discuss black hole production processes, or just ultimately, in a way that's sufficient to do perturbation theory? Both, but they, ultimately. Well, I mean, I think the problems are very different for those two classes of things. Well, right. I mean, there are there are already. Yeah, there are already problems at the sort of level of figuring out the local quantum field theory. Uh, you know, the states that match onto local quantum field theory. Okay, so you're going to talk about so the if you knew enough about the diagrams, diagram, you could answer. The next well, but we're trying. That's practice. the thing is, we're trying. To, you know, the whole, at least from the point of view of, uh, at least from one point of view, that ADS CFT tells us how to quantize gravity. You know. Well, that, what we're doing there, if we assert that, is you, trying to use the boundary theory to define the quantum gravity in the book. Why isn't, why, it, I mean, why isn't the thing that's analogous to the S matrix in ADS-CFT just boundary correlators in one Yeah, that's what Are I'm they, talking about here. Yeah. No, I mean, really, like a four-point function of, of local gauge invariant operators in the CFT. Those are LSE fine things. You just extrapolate the operators and the Th Those are fine things to consider, but let's think about their utility. If we're trying to describe, let me finish, things. let me finish. If we're trying to describe scattering at the LHC, yeah. how useful is it going to be to talk about correlators of operators that are you know, separated by 10 to the 10 light years from where we are now. That's what we do in the flat space. That's what the S matrix does, right? I mean, I agree we, it's not what actually happens in the real world, but. Uh, yeah, but the, so the question, but that's because we check that there is a nice map there, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of the whole LSE construction. The question, part of the question is, is there a, you know, correct LSE, or, or what is the LSE construction in ADS? But I think that's the, part the, of the question. It seems like the right way to formulate that, that is to take the quantities that are natural in the theory, which are these correlation functions, yeah. and then learn how to extract bulk physics from those. That seems to me to be more natural than to try to force it into this framework we use in Minkowski space. Well, there again, there are two two things we could try to do, and you know, I'm coming back to ultimately the question of bulk observables, which is, you know, I recognize that's you know. Another way to try to do it. There are questions there too, but uh, but you know ultimately uh, you know we're supposed to be matching onto the f you know familiar structure of the bulk theory. We need to broaden our. That's the goal. Familiar. Well, you can just say, well, okay, I'm going to forget about everything that happens at the LHC. All I care about is bulk or is boundary correlators, and then that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. But you're not matching on to what the rest of physics. <laughs> so. I mean, in particle physics, what we learn is how to extract a Lagrangian from an S matrix. My proposal is here we learn how to extract a Lagrangian from boundary correlators. Uh, well, what we'd really like to do is, uh, actually, it's not really necessarily a Lagrangian that we're after anyway. You know, we don't well, know what. because of gravity. No, but that's yeah. why Tom so, Sullivan was important. Well, okay, so the question is, what should we be computing in quantum gravity? And the two obvious targets are, you know, one, correlators of appropriate uh, you know, approximately local, say, bulk observables, although we've got to figure out what those are to begin with. I mean, you're hung up on something that has nothing to do with quantum gravity, right? I mean, this just has to do with the kinematics of the space. No, it's, I think, well, it has to do with whether the boundary theory can be used to define uh, quantum gravity theory in the bulk. I think it's, you know, can we decode the hologram? Okay, that's the subject of the week, and I know, you know, Everyone will have their own things to say about this, but I, I think it's fair to say that no one has M yet. And I'm trying to at least illustrate some of the issues with respect to that. So. Okay, so uh, there's a question of, again, uh, disentangling the interactions so that we can focus on a, a given... The difference between oh, ADS and flat space is a, in flat space, you get away with it if you have a one particle state which is stable and it does yeah. nothing for an infinite amount of time, essentially. Yeah, you, here, well, you can even create a multi particle state out here, yeah, and you know, them. yeah, all, all the junk you don't want goes away, and you're just for left an with the one particle. Time, you, you get away with it, and that's yeah. why you get that's an LSD. Yeah. Whereas here, it doesn't happen. Well, here, yeah, if you have the normalizable ones, then they interact. They'd never really separate. Right. 
Um, and if you have the non-normalizable ones, you think they're separating, but the amplitude is also growing, and so there's a competing effect, roughly speaking. It's again the statement that you're dealing with non-normalizable modes if they're truly coming in from the boundary. Yeah. And so the actual amplitude, so you've got to, basically if you want a one particle state here, you've got to start with an infinite number of particles here, so to speak, or infinite amplitude state here. And then the question is, uh, you know, if I have an infinite amplitude state here, you know, it's non-compact support, and likewise here, well, how do I keep them from interacting out near the boundary? So, so Steve, while I don't disagree with my colleagues, this next comment I'm going to make may not be necessary. It may be illustrative to mention that, again, if you look at tachyons near the bright and lower Friedman bound, yeah. it's not true that amplitude diverges near the boundary. Yeah, again, it can be finite, but again, it can be finite and of the same order, and that's something that same one has. Same order in what? Same order as the size of the interaction. That's something to check, at least, that it is, you know, say, parametrically small in, say, wave packet parameters or something like that. There's a check to be performed. So. That's just for the tachyon. Well, actually, well, so the generic state does have the infinities, but if these two states are gravitons or tachyons, or then then you don't have necessarily an infinity from this kind of interaction, but you can have a finite contribution. Steve, if, if the yeah. propagators for all those things fall off near the boundary, isn't it clear that they're suppressed in the limit where the ADS space is very large? You've got to take the uh, the behavior of the propagator, and then also there's a volume integral that's growing, and you've got to combine the things. Yeah, but those things are finite for these. Yeah, so they, again, for gravity, let's just take gravity. It's finite as you take the integral out to the boundary. Yeah. But the question is, is it parametrically small or not? It's a question. Okay. Seems like an easy question to answer. Uh, yep, seems like it. <laughs> We've looked in certain cases and, well. Sorry, Steve. I'm still very confused. You're in finite volume, you know, capital one field theory. So, yeah. how, how is this metric given? You know, it's, it's not an IF finite algorithm. So, what are you talking about? I mean, what you're talking about, the bulk? No, the, the boundary theory. She means the bulk cast matrix. Yeah. I'm trying to expect the boundary. Yeah, no, it's not the boundary. I'm talking about trying to get something that looks, approximates the bulk cast matrix from the boundary correlators. Okay, I don't want to get too hung up on this, but we could certainly discuss. I mean, sorry, you're, you're, you're insisting on more than that. Sorry. You just said you're, you're not happy with an approximation, it sounds like. Uh, I'm happy with a controlled approximation. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I thought you would agree that you could have wave packets that are very, very well localized, like in your picture, at a given time. And it's true that they'll bounce back and forth and interact in the past. Yeah. But I'm just repeating the approximation that one has in mind. Well, you're so waving the, your hands off, but no, the no, question no, is, I need to, to construct I'm, I'm a field out there. I'm just on the gravity side. Right? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not on the gra good. Okay. So just on the gravity side, don't you think that although you're in a box, you have an approximate scattering state as you've drawn there, if you consider wave packets that are well, just work with You're talking about ones. the normalizable ones. Yeah, so the, normalizable again, ones. the question is: the question is, in the normalizable case, uh, if I'm trying to build a wave packet, you know, that's doing this right here, what is the bulk, or sorry, the boundary construction of that state? And <laughs> that is something that we understand in the free theory, but oh, we don't understand, I don't think, uh, in the. Um, I, I think you're combining two questions. One is. It's a strong weak coupling duality, so deriving the duality is, is naturally difficult. But the other well, thing that you're talking about is just gravity side, you know, kinematics. So it's the latter that is all I was trying to address. Well. So, it, no. so of course it's true that there's not. I, I think we're confusing things. So let's back up. So we want to map from Hilbert space to Hilbert space. Okay, that's what we're after. That's our goal. Right. And the question is, uh, well, we expect there to be these kinds of states in the bulk Hilbert space. Yeah, and it's true that they don't, they're, they're not ever, you know, they, they do bounce back and so they interact in the past. That's true. Yeah, that as well. But then the question is, um, what is the M by which I construct these states 
from something on the boundary. And that we understand perfectly well at g equals 0. Zero coupling. We understand perfectly well. G being the coupling constant of the string, the string coupling constant. Uh, that we understand perfectly well at g equals 0. It's trivial. But the question of how to, re it's, well, it's, it's actually related to this business of how do you go from a boundary operator to a bulk operator over here. Uh, something we that's don't. constructible. <coughs> well, G. well, that's that's part of the question: is can we really get it order by order in G in a systematic fashion, and how? How do we do maybe, that? Maybe we better go ahead though, because uh, we want to let the entanglement people eat all of the cookies. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so there is a, there is this natural state of uh, arbitrary CFT, even with small m, which was recently discussed a lot, right? So if you take a CFT and you take uh, some sort of double trace, but even though double trace is a notion of large M, but in any CFT it was proven that there are the separators which have very large spin, which looks like two blobs in the bulb, in the bulb which collide. And for this you don't need large M, you don't need anything. It just comes for free from the crossing equation. Because it's work of I and D. Work of which? Uh, the M and uh, the M and oh, oh. Uh, Okay. So these states are really, really like a two blob states in a finite ten, uh, finite ten theory, and uh, yeah. so th this looks exactly like what you are asking for. Well, okay. So there is, if you're referring to, uh, say, their scattering state construction, is that what you're saying? This is a, this. So uh, I'd like to say that in any CFT uh, yeah. in higher than uh, or equal to three dimensions, there are operators which have dimension which is roughly dimension of two constituents. They have very large spin. And in the bulk, they will look like two uh, two blobs which collide, and yeah. they will be like very similar to this. For example, if you construct two two operators which are non-normalizable in, in the boundary, and you compute the kind of projection on a set of uh, operators in the bulk, this will be the maximum. Somehow they will mimic maximally mimic this this this, this assembly. Well, okay, it's so uh, so it's a question of detail. It's a question of whether we can construct the basis of the kinds of states we want that serve as scattering states. And uh, so, uh, you know, th that's really the goal. And I, I don't, it, well, maybe there's some work I'm not familiar with. I think the, the basic work, on, which I guess uh, Liam will talk about more later, uh, the basic work in sort of trying to construct scattering states is working about this free limit and I think runs into some of the questions I'm raising. But, you know, anyway, it's a question of, you know, how do we do it? What is the construction? Maybe, maybe I should say something. I mean, there are, you're, you're asking what, you know, how do we do it, what does the explicit way do it? But, yep. I mean, you are familiar with, you know, very explicit formulas for constructing them. And for, it's well, true that, it's true that, you know, Perturbing you about the free it, limit. No, but you don't need the free limit because you take things very far away from each other and you're taking the radius of ADS poster and the, and you're looking at things which are very far away, and when things are very far away, interactions between them shut off. So I'm not sure what you're worried about. Um, well, if you can control things in, you know, if you if you assume you have the bulk theory, you have the bulk theory. Let's phrase it that way. I'm not saying but that's not what, that's CFT. not the name of the game. They do is CFT. So. Um, the scattering states that these guys create, or, or well, or describe, are. Um, are basically, actually, they're basically states of this form, where you're creating them from non-normalizable data. No, they're from normalizable states. I've, well, we can, let's discuss that. I'll, we'll go to the relevant equation in your paper, and I'll show you. I'm, I'm just, just looking at it. I'm All right, so, so let's continue this later in the week. But, right, yeah. we go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the other possibility here that has been raised is, well, if we have problems with non-compact boundary data, what about uh, compact boundary data? Uh, so we take our function f that we smear by uh, compact. And basically by doing this, we're placing a restriction on the kind of wave packets that we can construct. And it turns out that you can show you don't have arbitrary wave packets in the bulk. Uh, when you do this, uh, you have, say, wave packets that can fall off exponentially for a while, but then in the end they have power law tails. And we've seen this pretty explicitly, uh, how this works. Uh, 
I can refer you to some of the well, some work a while ago with my student Michael Gary. And so if you don't have a full space of the kind of scattering states uh, that you would like, then there is a question of, uh, you know, is somehow this space of states enough to fully describe scattering or not? And uh, I think that we really do want better localization properties ultimately for our scattering states in the bulk. And in particular, you know, say if we're looking at scattering at, in high energies uh, to study black hole formation and evaporation, we really need exponential sensitivity to, uh, uh, to various, say, uh, amplitudes. And this kind of tail, I, I think, at least uh, naively, produces a problem with that. Now, is there some way of taking a limit so you can always eliminate the tails, et cetera, et cetera? I don't know. That's a question. So I'm just putting that question out there. So that's the problem with boundary compact states. So in conclusion, uh, in this first part, uh, we don't know that we can, or at least we don't know how to identify good scattering states in the uh, boundary Hilbert space. Now, if you can identify good scattering states, uh, there's also a question of, uh, you know, whether you produce correct properties for the S matrix, and there's a certain amount of structure that's needed in the correlators in order to do that, to get, you know, basically the momentum conserving delta function, the poles of the S matrix, and so on. Uh, and one of the questions is whether that's actually structure that's present in uh, N equals 4 super Yang Mills, and uh, Sasha Zhubayedov uh, will talk some about that in, I guess it's tomorrow afternoon's discussion. So that's uh, sort of uh, leading up to some of that uh, discussion that we'll have. Okay, now there's also this related Mellon story uh, that a lot have contributed to, including, of course, Liam and uh, Kaplan. Uh, and let me first sketch what it says and then uh, outline at least some of the questions I see with that, and I'm hoping to get some of those addressed. Uh, they probably will be addressed uh, as part of the talks. So the idea is that if we have a boundary correlator, uh, we can represent that as an integral over some uh, sort of conjugate Mellon variables, the gammas, uh, of a Mellon transform or Mellon uh, amplitude, and then this is just the usual uh, gamma function generalization of the factorial, uh, and some measure for integration over gamma. So the idea is at least, well, we can show at least in simple cases we can represent correlators this way. And if you can extract the Mellon amplitude in a unique fashion from this, uh, then you can... Uh, again, in these simple cases, show that that Mellon amplitude can basically be integrated in a certain way to construct the reduced transition matrix element. Yes? It was never shown, right, that this thing exists, this Mellon amplitude. So only... Well, that's why I... Okay, good. <laughs> in simple cases, and, you know, there's a question of higher spin, there's a question of higher loops, uh, you know, it's a challenge to, uh, in fact, show that, in general, you can find these Mellon amplitudes. Uh, it's, it's a question, right? You can write the inverse transform, where the M is defined in terms of the correlation function, and then you can ask when this transform exists. And this is a certain, it, it does not exist always. It involves some not very well, not very well understood limits, as far as I understand. So it's, 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 it's an inverse, it's an inverse transform, which is completely robust, but the question is, is the integrals are convergent, and what does the physics define this? So, yeah, yeah. There's some question of uniqueness as well, I guess. Well, I think uniqueness is actually is completely clear. So it's, it's just, it's almost like Laplace, it's, it's almost like inverse of Laplace transforms that you wrote, so we just write the yeah. direct Laplace transform, and then uh, it exists when the Functions satisfy certain properties and say yeah. modulo for, for some uh, theories it just does not satisfy. Yeah. So, so this good. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, some CFDs. Yeah, for free. For, well, it's a little bit uh, generate cases, but for free theory, it does not exist. The integral. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very simple thing. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the. So there is a question of how to get M or whether we can get M in general. Uh, and 
Uh, then from there, uh, you know, you could re basically if you had it, uh, which you don't know you do, uh, you can give the reduced transition matrix element, but still that's not the S matrix. The reduced transition matrix element is like, you know, instead of basically couplings in the theory, uh, it's not giving you the full structure of the uh, S matrix directly. Uh, so um, you take S, the S matrix, minus 1, and it's equal. Divide by I? No, no. No. No, no. <laughs> Hold on. S minus 1 is equal to, you know, delta function, which, you know, has a lot of the structure of the scattering states, et cetera, et cetera. In flat space, it's true, of course, but delta function times reduced transition matrix L. Uh, so we can basically, it's not a surprise, I think, that you can read off some of the couplings of the bulk effective field theory if uh, you have the boundary correlators and if we assume there's a bulk effective field theory. But this is not yet a construction of the full bulk quantum theory, which, by the way, isn't just an effective field theory. We're after some, something else in the bulk for the full theory. What we'd like, again, is a construction that goes from the boundary Hilbert space to the uh, and so on to the bulk Hilbert space, the set of useful operators, and say the time evolution operator. And so for that reason, I would say that this work of um, Kaplan and Fitzpatrick, you know, it's clearly had some success, but I think it looks to me like there are some limits to that. And I'm looking forward to sort of an update, and, and we'll talk more about that, I hope. Okay, so what about constructing local bulk observables? And if we have the local bulk observables, we should be able to do what I've been describing if we could just you know, construct the bulk you know, analogs of the field operators. Then we could use them like in LSZ to make wave packets and so on. And we could do even better things like study the interiors of black holes and so on, which is a question that's been a burning question for us. I guess uh, that's a pun, but anyway, <laughs> the whole firewall story. Uh, now, the first question, though, is, so I'm switching gears to the, you know, bulk operators. The first question is, what operators are we trying to construct? What structure do they have? And so we had some discussion Friday about how we should even think about uh, gauge invariant, say, diffeomorphism invariance looks like the, you know, the long distance, at least approximation of gauge invariant. What are the good gauge invariant operators, and how do we think about them in gravity? Uh, there's the whole business of, uh, you know, thinking about gravitationally dressed operators and so on. And, and ultimately, uh, presumably, things like that should be the targets of such a construction. Uh, now, there's an approach to this, which uh, uh, Dan Kabat and others uh, have pioneered, uh, which is perturbative in the string coupling, basically 1 over n. So let me just quickly uh, review that. Uh, first, at the free level, we have our, it, forgetting the gravitational dressing for now, we have, say, a bulk field, and that asymptotes to, uh, via the usual, whatever, extrapolate map, a boundary operator times some uh, characteristic falloff related to the conformal dimension. Uh, and then the idea is, uh, if we know basically this asymptotic behavior, we can use a certain Green's function in Green's theorem to reconstruct the bulk field from that asymptotic behavior. And so that goes via this sort of limit of the Green's function, which is uh, k. It's called a smearing function. And that's what allows us in the free theory to get back from the uh, boundary behavior to the actual bulk field. Uh, so it's not too surprising that this works at g equals 0, first of all. You're basically just reading off the bulk field from its boundary behavior. Uh, but what about in the full nonlinear theory? So uh, let's think about a toy example that was discussed, uh, well, in these papers. Uh, in particular, I'm referring to the discussion of uh, uh, HMPS uh, with a simple... Uh, say, cubic interaction, so that's the equation of motion, the operator equation of motion. We can use the same Green's theorem argument, and then we have a relationship between the boundary values of this field, now the interacting field, and the field in the bulk, but there's an extra term that comes from the interaction. And the expectation is that this is the leading contribution to the bulk field, 
And this is a small correction. It's got a G in front of it, after all. And G is you know, string coupling, which we could take to be small. So this is an exact equation, but then you can iterate this by plugging uh, this formula for phi back in over here and, and keep going and develop an expansion, formally at least, in G. So all looks like it is good. There's at least one question here, though, and that is uh, this field is normalized. What well, has normalizable behavior? So say it goes to zero as x goes to infinity. But this actually, in general, is non-normalizable. The um, behavior of the Green's function, uh, in general, tells you that. So this term is non-normalizable. Of course, you know this is an exact equation. That's normalizable, so this also must be non-normalizable, and there has to be a cancellation. So in other words, this goes to infinity as x goes to infinity, well, as it, does... Steve, it's integrable. I mean, it, it's defined in a way that the integral exists, even though, it, I mean, is, there's, a, there's an epsilon prescription. Um, that makes the integral exist. You're saying this is normalizable or finite? It's finite. I agree it's finite, but it's non-normalizable. Um, it grows towards the boundary. Okay, sure. You're not, it's not the boundary. I misunderstood your point. Yeah. It's yeah. non-normalizable. Uh, so, yeah, so it's finite at any finite x, but it goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. So that tells you at least x is that x. So that tells you that um, that... Uh, this, what we thought was small, or sorry, leading term plus small correction, at least for large enough x, is really something really big minus, minus something else really big, and they have to cancel to but give you something that's variance not says really all big. x's are the same, so this doesn't really seem like it could be an issue. Uh, well, I might turn that around, and that might say that if it's an issue for any x, it's an issue for all x. But Don and I had a discussion on this this morning, and Don was saying he agreed with this, but he thought that... Uh, you know, for, say, small enough x, you don't have an issue. So, um, small x, you mean the deeper in the ball? Yeah. Or, or yeah. Well, Further from the boundary. And, and so this is, it's actually, it's going to be dependent on the state. That's what's going to sort of effectively break conformal invariance is which, uh, well, I think, yeah, which operator you're using here. Um, so, but anyway, this, this fact that you have the, quote, leading and small terms, uh, both divergent as you go to the boundary, uh, and that they you have to have a cancellation of that big contribution from each of them to get the actual answer, really calls into question how you formulate a systematic perturbation expansion that looks like this. Is that just big what happens in big. ordinary renormalized perturbation theory and quantum field theory? Yes. What, what are you... Oh, you mean yeah, with yes. the, the yeah. cutoff, et cetera? Yeah, you, have a, you put it in terms yeah. of the bare cutoff, and oh my god, there's a huge yeah. divergence in the zeroth order, and there's an even bigger one in the second order, but miraculously, ah, good. it reorganizes. Yeah. Into good, okay, so so um, it took decades of work to show that all works. It's not trivial that it all works, right? Okay, but That's the whole, it, it, it's plausible. You know, showing that, well, this is not a, exactly the same problem. Uh, well, so it is though because this is constructed exactly to have the property that when you take it to the boundary you've got a good operator. It satisfies some equation of motion. Doesn't the yeah. equation of motion govern this equation? Fall off? Yeah. 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 All these terms. It does govern, govern the fall off, but uh, and, and the boundary condition you, you're solving it with the boundary conditions that nothing bad happens at so, the boundary. Yes. Yeah, so the, there are divergences you'll encounter if you try to actually do loop diagrams. So those would come at order g squared. Yeah. At, at the order you're working. Um, those corrections you're adding actually fall off faster near the boundary than the leading term. Corrections I'm adding. Yeah, your, your small correction. This, no, this is non-normal. If it's non-zero, it's non-normalizable. And if it's non-normalizable, it grows towards the boundary. Uh, That's just true. This Green's function has non-normalizable behavior. You can check it in your paper. The, the, the Green's function does, but you're asking about after you've done the integral over x prime? Against... Um, say the leading contribution to yeah. phi squared. Yeah, so the only place, this goes to another, this guy, we should, uh, well, I don't have a lot more to say, but I do have a little more, so let me try to keep this brief and we should discuss it more fully. Um, let's look at, for starters, this, because I'm saying this is non normalizable, this is non normalizable, and the non normalizability, or the non normalizable piece cancels. This uh, will be normalizable only for O's that, sat, that come from a field in the bulk that satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. Now, in general, this doesn't, 
because uh, it's you know the free solution plus something else. And there's no guarantee that when you add the plus something else, you get the normalizable behavior that you would have had. And generically, you don't. Of course, this you can help yourself discussion. by making use of the one over n expansion in the field theory. What's that? You can help yourself by making use of the one over n expansion in the field theory. Uh, you mean, well, that's basically the G expansion here. Just it's not the same, because, because if you consider the leading term to be the integral dB of k against O leading at 1 over n, then that's going to give you something that doesn't have your non-normalizable behavior. So the leading term, yeah, there's um, k times O leading. Right. You say, yeah, and then, but then there's another term. And there's another term. Which is part, yeah, so you could try to organize. Okay, there's so this is something I... Of, there are lots of ways to attack there are this ideas of, There are standard good. methods for attacking things like good. this. Good. There are ways to attack this problem. It would be good to try to see systematically how it works. But at this level, uh, at least at a first pass, it's not clear that you have a systematic perturbation expansion, at least as originally designed. And the question is, can you turn it into a systematic procedure? Well, I, so I, before... I, I have something about what you're going to say, I think, on the next slide. It was originally designed, I think it was only supposed to be systematic at fixed x as an asymptotic series in G. Right. So I think but that's not really good enough because what we'd like is something like QED where we have, say, a finite coupling constant, but we get a finite but small, and we get useful answers, say, if we go out at least to you know some number of orders in perturbation theory. Well, not always. Sometimes you have to resum. For example, if you Sometimes discover you that there's hydrogen. Sometimes you have to resum. But I, well, I'll leave it at that. And you and I did discuss it completely. Okay, so a possible, at least, um, critique of the operator program is uh, that we really, first of all, rely on uh, the bulk equations in doing this, although there is a... Um, set of statements that you can derive the same thing in principle uh, by enforcing bulk locality, still sort of referring to bulk properties and the question of, you know, in what sense are you really getting away from, you know, leaning on the bulk to get the bulk? But uh, I hope a valid question. There's, you know, how do we really construct the, what are behaving as the effective uh, bulk operators, you know, purely from the boundary theory? Uh, there's this issue with the systematics of the expansion uh, that at least naively in the expansion I wrote down there's no small parameter because the terms are comparable. Don thinks there's a way to do it. We had a discussion on the blackboard this morning. You know, we'll, it's something that ought to be sorted out. Uh, and of course there's the question of again what are the uh, correct gauge invariant operators to go after. So of course Dan uh, Kaba will update us on this program and, you know, would address some of these questions in his talk. Also, in a sense, you don't want, I mean, you know, the bulk theory is best described as a string theory. Well, or, well, in this case, yeah, in the, in the basic, yeah, the basic conjecture is it's a string theory. That's right. Yeah. So there are, this is only an approximation anyway, you can neglect the string theory. Yeah, well, yeah, what are the correct kinds of operators to go after in the, you know, quantum mechanics theory, so quantum there, mechanical there, theory that's the there, string there, theory. There was this uh, NS version of the DDS3 CFT2 correspondence where, in fact, Juan and Hiroshi's gave formulas for right. the correlators. But do you know how to formulate theory. that in, in four dimensions? Four dimensions? In DDS1. Well, I th uh, so you're referring to what again? Well, I thought the question was about stringy effects and how far one can go with that. No, I mean, how would you go in principle? Well, in principle, you Gordon equation. You, you know, you, oh, you, would yeah, solve, okay. you would solve the string field equations. Yeah, now, now, it's something now, like... I have no <laughs> idea what those are, but presumably something like... David that. knows enough about them to, <laughs> to say... You would hope that there's a formula. Yeah. If there was some, if string, if closed string field theory made sense, which I can't promise you at all, then you could do the same thing. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, it does. It gets into that set of questions, doesn't it? Well, Wait, sorry, sorry. Again, there's this challenge. example where they've they've given all the they've resummed all the alpha prime effects in correlators. Radius three. 
for yeah, but you can make the sphere big, the T4 as big as you want. So to give boundary correlators, but do they identify useful bulk operators? Well, so so they they did a study of the spectrum, which included things like massive strings bouncing around and strings doing this. Um, and it you know the symmetry helps a lot. The things they, that they calculate are large R limit, small R limit, it doesn't matter. You're always getting boundary correlations. You can get the S matrix. In principle, you could get the S matrix in six dimensions from their calculation. Right. Mm -hmm. Or to infinity, like you said, but you're not going to get a local bulk operator well, what would you any want? of those forms. I mean, what, what would you actually I'm want? Sorry, you're talking. I, 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 I think I don't really understand why people want local bulk operators, because we don't have any evidence from any place in string theory that there is such a thing. Okay. Well, somebody but likes them. I, those calculations you're talking about, I think, are, are perfectly good. They do include all the stringy effects. They will give the S matrix in six dimension, but but they won't have local bulk operators. I, I, in the as you know, I completely agree with that as well. I think there are yeah. more interesting stringy corrections than. As, as um, usually estimated, but that's a different. As Ben has pointed out, there are cookies at stake. <laughs> so let's. And, and so anyway, but yeah, it's an important set of questions. You know, what are we trying to match onto, or approximately construct, or, or actually construct in the bulk theory? Uh, there's also a set of puzzles which I think is going to be part of the dialogue about different realizations of these supposed bulk field operators. Uh, for example, coming from different ADS Rindler patches in which you could construct them. And so this leads to this whole set of uh, questions regarding uh, this error correcting code story, which of course Dan will talk about, uh, and uh, sort of a related viewpoint, uh, which Vladimir will talk about uh, whether you're somehow getting the correct structure from uh, gauge symmetry. And I gather there's going to be some interesting debate on that. So just to uh, sort of finish, uh, there at the least is a question, how can we decode the hologram? Uh, we don't understand how to do that yet, I don't think. And if so, you know, if you've got M in your pocket, you know, bring it forward and we'll, uh, see if it passes the test. Uh, now, if we don't know how we can decode the hologram, I think it's a legitimate question whether we can decode the hologram. Uh, so, however you want to read this, though, I think it, hopefully we agree that this is uh, something we really should be addressing uh, and will be uh, addressing with lively discussion this week. And it's, uh, again, uh, seems to be an unsettled question, exactly how it works with the various issues in mind. Now, you might say, if you couldn't, what's an alternative? Uh, given all that we've learned, the great success of ADS-CFT, uh, at least in reading it the other way, starting with the bulk and reading off all kinds of useful uh, information about the structure of boundary theories, and at least one proposal is that, uh, well, maybe there's a map here that in some sense coarse grains uh, the Hilbert space or the space of states or the dynamics uh, and so that's just an alternative possible viewpoint, uh, which uh, has been mentioned. I, I've mentioned it in the past, and something like this has been mentioned by uh, Don and Aaron Wall. Uh, and so that, or something like it, is at least a possible alternative. It's something we uh, might consider. Uh, and then this success of ADS-CFT uh, plausibly, in my mind, could... Uh, well, or at least a, there's a question, how much of the success comes from the combination of symmetry and universality, uh, implying the close connection between the structure without necessarily implying the um, detailed uh, fine-grained correspondence between the two, two, two theories. So uh, I will stop there, but we can have a little more discussion before cookies. Broader context in which we are asking this question of decoding hologram. Are you, are you thinking this? We didn't answer. Isn't there a valid question? Which class of theories will 
I mean, if, if I write down some random CF, CFT, probably doesn't have yeah. gravity dual. Isn't that an even broader? Even yeah, there's a broader set of questions, you know, which, well, the, the first question is, let's just take the, the purest, simplest thing, n, n equals 4 super Yang mills. Okay. Uh, can we reconstruct the bulk string theory from that or not? And if so, how? Right. And so that's I the simplest thing. But then you can say, well, okay, if we do it there, then you know, what other CFTs can we construct bulk theories from? And what's the cri what criteria are there for being able to uh, construct bulk theories? And obviously, you know, not every CFT is going to right. have you know, a large radius but, bulk theory. But is it correct to say when this whole discussion, which I was obviously listening to, but I just trying to understand, the, you had in mind say n is equal to four super young males. Is it will it be correct to say that? For well, at least for this discussion, yeah, I, I just want one definition that's you know perfect of a quantum gravity. Uh, for now, you know that would be a nice start. Uh, but but you know that is part of the question because you know if it is going to reproduce quantum gravity in the bulk, there are certain properties it has to have to do that since we know that not every CFT will. And you know what are they? That's part of the question is identifying the properties that are sufficient to give you the correct bulk behavior. But, but if I look at the, the talk you just mentioned, the, this error correcting code which Dan will talk about, I don't see any obvious relation with anything with n is equal to four super young males or, or, uh, or, 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 or is there? I mean, it's well, not, I'll no, let Dan supposed address to, that. It's supposed to have to do with anything. I mean, you think there are more CFTs that have gravity duals? I mean, right. I mean, aspects of what we said are true. I mean, actually, one weak part of what we did. Is that is that sub ADS locality is not very manifest. So so our story applies in a broader class of CFTs that we think really have local gravity duals. And you have a criteria which if I give you a CFT would you yes or no answer? We have a list of uh, of sort of necessary but not sufficient conditions. And, and that's kind of like solving the cosmological constant problem. <laughs> because you're trying to get a large a large radius. And so I just wanted to mention, and I'll just, I'll just say this once and then shut up about it, but you know, d brains still remain a good way to probe local physics uh, and string theory if we use the fact that these are string theories. And, um, so that in addition to gravity waves and entanglement, I think uh, the, the duals of d brains like baryons and Coulomb brain variables uh, remain a good, a good approach to, yeah. to localizing things in the Well, I think that's sort of complementary to this because we could consider either, you know, scattering amplitudes involving D brains or try to come up with local observables that just, you know just, describe just, where a D brain is. Yeah, just uh, place them out in the they just sit there, just place them. Well and well that that's easy to cavalierly say and I can put my cup of coffee on the table, but the diff invariant description of that is <laughs> not quite so simple. <coughs> right. So, you know, what is the gauge invariant description well, of that? Invariant. Invariant. Cool Completely invariant description of it. Sorry, uh, well. like to say what it's doing out at infinity, and then it does whatever it wants. And, you know, well, yeah, so matching so that I, on. I think that's what he's trying to Right, I mean, of course I agree there's no derivation quantity. of the whole duality. Nobody's saying that. But it's just another probe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's Point taken? Anything else? Okay, well, I hope we have a lot more good discussion uh, for the rest of the week.